guys, we're Dan and Michelle with Honeymoon Always, and today we're here to talk to you about literally Dan's least favorite subject ever, taxes. Now, we mentioned in our last video that taxes are something that are super complicated for Americans moving to Portugal. And we got a lot of questions about that because I think there are people who don't understand why it would be so complicated, why it would cause people to, I don't know, be frustrated or even potentially even leave Portugal. And we get so many DMs for the, for the past year, we've gotten so many DMs about taxes and people wanting to do the right thing with taxes. So our goal today is to talk to you about taxes with an actual tax expert. Now, when I said that this is my least favorite subject, some people in the last video took that as, I don't wanna pay taxes or I don't understand taxes. And they were saying things like, well, you know, that's what pays for our healthcare. It's like, I get it. <laughs> I know what taxes are and I'm happy to pay my fair share. The thing is, it's just complicated when an American moves to Portugal because America is one of three countries that continues to tax its citizens regardless of where they live. And there are just cultural differences and legislative differences when you try to combine two different tax codes and make them work together. So that is why taxes are so hard for me. And in the US, I understood the tax system well enough to do my taxes on our own. We lived in Texas where there are no state taxes. It's all comes, their funding comes through property taxes. So like it was fairly straightforward and simple to do our taxes in the US. But moving here, it became much more difficult. So today we're going to talk about those differences and how some of um, most people that reach out to us, their situation and how taxes would be taken care of for them. We want to be very clear that this is absolutely not tax advice. <laughs> so while we will be talking with an actual tax expert here whom we do recommend, we are not providing any actual tax advice. You should definitely talk to at least like three to five tax professionals in Portugal who can understand and speak to your specific situation. The only caveat is if you're retired, some things are pretty straightforward. You can probably just talk to one tax expert and they'll probably have enough information if you're just living off of like a 401k or a pension or things like that, because those are straightforward. Otherwise, please speak to multiple tax experts to get different opinions and to help you really understand what your tax situation will be before you come here. We know taxes is a pretty dry topic, so this may not be for everyone, but we actually have some really exciting, fun, engaging content coming up, a big project we're about to announce like really, really soon. So please stay tuned to our channel to hear all about what's next for us. So obviously we are not tax experts. Also, this is not tax advice, but we wanted to bring an actual tax expert here to help answer all the questions that we get all the time about taxes here, specifically with the D7 visa. If you wanna speak with him about your taxes, we will leave all of his information in the description below. All right, we are here with Zev from Fresh Portugal, and we will have his contact information below in the description. Uh, but first, you aren't Portuguese. So how did you get into becoming a Portuguese tax expert? Yeah, well, nobody's perfect, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I came to Portugal with my family during the pandemic, and we uh, we got stuck. There was, uh, it was, uh, we came from the UK. It was the time of the big lockdowns and the alpha variant, and uh, we, we found ourselves falling in love with the country and just staying. We were initially in Madeira and now in Lisbon. I'm a tax lawyer by profession, a tax and IP lawyer. Initially, it, I, I was just, I had no plans of expanding my practice into, into Portugal. I mean, I have a, a reasonably successful IP and tax practice worth 13 lawyers now between the UK and the US. Then I tried to figure out how my tax is going to work in Portugal. Initially, I was just puzzled by the fact that I can't get straight answers to uh, to my own tax situation. But And, and after some time, I, I sort of after researching and figuring out how uh, taxes work and reading the law, reading the, the relevant double taxation treaties and understanding it, people started asking me, okay, so you know, you're a lawyer, what have you done with your taxes? Eventually, it occurred to me that basically nobody knows or very few people know how, how taxes work and for good reasons. So I, I, I ended ended up adding uh, Portuguese lawyers to my practice and, uh, and expanding into Portugal. So we, we cover both the uh, Portuguese side, but also the, the US side, the UK side, uh, the Australian side, or, you know, this we, we have qualified lawyers in these countries, but also other countries. And, uh, and we advise people and we feel that we're really helping them. Yeah, definitely. I feel like I went through the same thing where I, we, I was doing the research about my tax situation and had to dive really deep, speak to a ton of people and got different answers. And then once I moved here and we had this YouTube channel, people started reaching out to me asking for tax advice. And I'm like, no, <laughs> like I'm not a lawyer. 
there. Um, but that's awesome that you're now able to provide uh, that perspective as someone who has made the, ch the move. Yeah, it's actually really tough because the, the Portuguese system, and, and it's unlike anything I've ever seen in any other country before, uh, it, it created a system where the, I'm sure we'll talk about NHR, but they, they created a system for foreigners that's a system that's supposed to encourage people to come to Portugal and where the taxation is based on the either the effective taxation in the other country where people are coming from or on the potential of taxation in the other country which all, all, all already sounds kind of weird and you know whether you could be taxed in the other country is something that you find in the double taxation treaty which is the world that, that we've we're living in but you can't really advise on portuguese taxation without understanding what happens in the other country right. so it's it's sort of already structured in a way that's that requires you to understand uh, both systems to understand complexity and it's very it, sometimes there are gray areas to to deal with how do you deal with with a gray area when, where the taxation is not clear so it, it's kind of it's it's complex on its on the surface then you come to a tax return Portuguese is a tax return country. You declare your income. You say what you have. And uh, there are categories. Some of these categories are easy to understand, like employment income or, or self-employment income. But some of these countries, uh, categories just don't match what other countries have. And uh, Portugal doesn't have uh, LLCs. It doesn't have S-Corps. It doesn't know what these things are. And it's for you to say what your income is. So you have to really understand the different types of income in the other country and both what are they close to? How should you be reporting them? You know, considering there's no easy way or straightforward way to report them. And, and also, what is the good way for you to report them? So mm -hmm. sometimes it can be more than one thing. So what do you do then? Yes. So it, it's, it's kind of, it, it's maybe the most complicated tax system in the world. That, that's on one end. On the other hand, you have a services industry with lawyers that are suddenly overwhelmed by an insane amount of people that are coming at the same time with really complicated situations. And it hasn't yet sort of built up that expertise mm -hmm. uh, outside the the big four accounting firms to uh, to advise people on these things. So yeah, and it's a it's, it's a really interesting niche. And people people tell me that, you know taxes it's boring. It's not boring. It's actually quite interesting. Yeah, I it's mean, very important as well. And it's people's livelihood. Definitely. definitely. And I've uh, when I moving here, I found that speaking to different tax experts, I got different answers and some uh, I think I f and I feel like in in the US if I spoke to a CPA they're more willing to say I don't know let me look into that whereas here I felt like they were giving me an answer to my question whether they actually knew it or not and so then I would get conflicting answers from different accounts so I see like this cultural difference as well um, I also experienced ghosting where I would have a call with an accountant and they'd be like, oh, okay, this sounds great. You know, I'm gonna check in on this and then we'll move forward. And then I would never hear from them. And then I would reach out two weeks later and still like never hear from them. Yeah, it's it's tough because you know, really there there is a, a massive influx, and uh, you know one of the, the the nicest things about the Portuguese consultants is that they don't like to say no and they don't yeah. like to reject you. They want to give you an answer, but sometimes it's just too tough. If they don't understand the American system, for example, they, they really should be reaching out to an American right. uh, person, and they know that, so they they would okay now. Who am I like to ask in, in America? And in the meantime, you wait. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, th there is definitely a problem and, uh, and and I'm seeing that a lot. Okay, so getting into the nitty gritty, what exactly is the NHR? So NHR is a preferential tax regime that Portugal created to attract people from other countries to come. It's a regime that gives people exemption on certain types of income, primarily passive income, but not just, and a, a preferential rate on other types of income. So there are some professions and, and that Portugal wants to attract, so these these professions get a better tax rate than, than other professions. And then there, there is full exemption on some other types of income. It's basically Portugal's way to say, why don't you come to Portugal and spend your money here? Right. And um, when you said like uh, certain professions, is that what people refer to as highly, like high value add professions? Yeah, yeah there's a list. Sometimes uh, things come in, in and out of the list. Generally, it's generally a list of the, the sort of things that Portugal wants to see or you know, people that are missing. And so I think people know about software developers that are in shortage everywhere. Yeah. It would be IT consultants on that list. But there are, it's, it's other things like builders. You know, we, there's a shortage, so that's also on the list. And an interesting one is managers of companies. So you, know, you think of managers of companies as a very senior position and you can see why it's, why it's on the list. But it's, a, it's an interesting one because anyone can become a manager on the, of, of a company. Yeah. yeah. So um, just uh, some, some, some thoughts on planning. So yeah. Okay, so I'm going to run through a couple scenarios that we get asked the most. So first would be 
I work for a US-based company. My manager has told me that I can work from anywhere. How should um, that person approach taxes when they come to Portugal? Yeah, so for, it depends on how much they make and what they do. Generally, employment, but yeah, in, in the US, it's W2. It doesn't work as a long-term solution. The um, uh, tax rate is unclear about employment income. It, it gives Portugal taxation rights on employment income. And then it also says that the US can ignore it and tax its citizens. And it, it creates this anomaly and clarity, lack of clarity. So it doesn't really work. I mean, you can, you can do that and you can file your returns, but there is some risk that there'll be audits and you'll, it'll, it'll be a mess. And uh, it, I mean, generally, I would say that if you must do that, the right thing to do is to pay tax in Portugal and go claim the money back in the US because you are a Portuguese resident, Portugal wants to tax you and the US will respect that. So you know, that's, not, that's not typically a good long-term arrangement. So you're, you're left with being directly a contractor. So what, what's in, in the US is a 1099 or you can incorporate an entity. In the US, it'll be an LLC or, uh, or an S Corp if you're an American citizen or a C Corp. And uh, sometimes it's very lucrative to incorporate an entity. There are, again, uh, mismatches that sometimes work in your favor. Yeah. So as a W-2 employee, you would want to first pay your income tax in Portugal, which hopefully you're a high value added profession. So it'd be like at a lower rate of 20%. And then when you do your U.S. tax return, you would claim that you already paid this tax over here, which would deduct your amount that you pay in the U.S., which usually is less anyway. So you probably wouldn't owe anything in the U.S. Yeah, I mean, you, you need to pay attention to timing because you, you file your tax return and then you pay. So you file your Portuguese tax return and pay, and then you file your, your U.S. tax return, and right. you, you sort of need to, make, to, to pay attention to the dates. But yeah. yes, what, what you said is generally correct. If you must be. If you must be. A W-2, yeah. Yeah, which is also an interesting point because the U.S., the taxes are due in, you file them in April. Yeah. And then here you file them in June. Yeah. So you have to file for an extension in the US. So it's just, it kind of shows how complicated it is if you do stay as a W 2 employee. But you mentioned uh, becoming a contractor. And I see a lot of people that move here and they say, you know, I'm a software developer. I would do a bunch of contract work. So for them, how would they approach taxes? They can work directly. So issue receipts, uh, issue invoices from the finance uh, portal and directly to their uh, US uh, clients. And uh, yes, they have a preferential tax rate. Uh, and, oh, but but they you know they would still pay they would sp still need to pay social security on top of that okay. so it's it's not that low I and mean, it's pretty low but it's not that low it's very simple so that there's the benefit of simplicity if they if they make like a standard 50 60 70k salary that, that is that is usually what they do and it, and it makes sense if it's people on very high salaries sometimes it makes sense to incorporate because uh, uh, the LLC for example if in the US it makes no difference if you if you have an LLC you're still considered to be self-employed right so so he would, you might assume that it doesn't make a difference in Portugal as well, but that's not the case. So LLCs are considered to be companies in Portugal. And uh, one of the benefits of the NHR regime is uh, that uh, distributions from companies are exempt from taxation. There are, you know, there's a whole set of risks that comes with that and a separate analysis to do. But in theory, if you work for a company, the, the company's distributions are not taxed in Portugal so long as you meet certain uh, criteria. So higher earners might want to consider what is the best way for them to uh, to go about. Okay, so if you're making, you said kind of maybe 60, kind of your average American salary, you might want to just claim it here as if as a Portuguese self-proprietor. If you are in a high value profession, yes. If you're in high, okay. Um, if, so if you're in a high value profession and you are definitely in a high value profession because some things are borderline, then you're not making a massive, uh, you don't have a massive income. Usually the, the easiest way to go is also the right one. If you're either not in a high value profession, so you will be taxed in full Portuguese rates, which are a lot, or if you if you have a very high income, and again, the 20% the plus social security builds up to quite a significant, quite significant taxation, you should be considering what to do and maybe take advice. So you mentioned social security. As a sole proprietor, how much is it? Is it yeah, so it's it uh, from the third year onwards, it's almost fifteen percent. Okay, uh, there's a slightly complicated calculation. It's twenty one percent, but seventy percent of that. Uh, so it's it's from the third year onwards, it's almost fifteen uh, percent. It's like fourteen point nine percent. Then on on the first year, there is a full uh, the first twelve months, there is a full uh, exemption from that, so you don't need to pay uh, social security in Portugal in the first year. Uh, but uh, and on the second uh, year, you can slightly reduce it, but generally it's fifteen percent. 
Okay, so it's interesting that you bring up social security because a lot of people leave that out of the conversation. But from what I understand, once again, we're kind of in that average American salary, 50 to 70K. You set up the sole proprietorship, you're gonna be taxed on the income and then a discounted or a discounted social security for the first two years, which the first year is actually completely eliminated. And then once you get to the third year, then you're looking at 15% social security. Yeah. Which is actually the very similar to self-employment for Social Security in the U.S. because if you're self-employed in the U.S., you have to pay the employer side of Social Security yep. and the employee's part of Social Security. So it really is a bunch of a difference. Yeah. That's very similar. Cool. So we've kind of touched a little bit on the idea of incorporating as an LLC or creating an S-Corp before you come to Portugal if you're doing these types of activities. So let's talk about that. A lot of people approach us and say, hey, I have an LLC in the US. What do I do about taxes when I move to Portugal? Yeah, probably stay as you are. And at the moment, LLCs have the edge okay. um, in, in Portugal. And uh, the reason is that in the US, LLCs are ignored for tax purposes. LLCs are the taxes partnerships, not the S-Corp ones. Right. They're ignored for tax purposes. They're basically transparent. Uh, people pay tax in their individual capacity and they're they're paying as self-employed. Portugal doesn't treat it this way. There are some, some decisions on that. And for, from a Portuguese perspective, an LLC is a company, yeah. uh, which means that the profits that are made in the LLC, company profits, taxed in the US if there is taxation. And the distributions are distributions. So if they are within the NHR scheme, the distributions are generally exempt from taxation. So anything made and, and generated within the, the, the LLC is normally exempt from taxation. That, that is the general rule. Provided the LLC, and that is the risk, uh, provided the LLC is effectively not effectively managed from Portugal, and that is the risk, okay. um, or that is one risk, the main risk at the moment. Because they could say, okay, so you have an LLC, it's incorporated in the, in the US, so what? You're living in Portugal, you're doing day-to-day -day management in Portugal, uh, so we're just going to treat it as a Portuguese company. They don't normally do that, partially because the, the burden of proof is on them. They okay. need to show that the LLC is not a legitimate uh, US company. It's particularly hard for them when the LLC existed before someone came to Portugal. So timing is a huge consideration. If someone comes to Portugal and starts working and they think, oh, we'll deal with taxes when the time comes and they start working in a certain way and they pay taxes in a certain way. And so suddenly they change, they, they figure out, oh, hold on, LLC is really good for me. So they, they incorporate a foreign company and then they file the, their taxes this way. That could get people in trouble. So that, that's the sort of thing that could that the, the authorities could say, oh, hold on, this is tax avoidance. It's not okay at all. But if, if a structure exists, existed before you came, it's very hard to attack this structure and, and say that it's not legitimate. They can still say, okay, you know, it's effectively managed from Portugal. So f as of this date, we're going to stop treating it as an American company. And part of what we do when, when we plan tax taxation is we think about this scenario. And then people realize, oh, hold on, I have, I have a partner who's not based in Portugal. I have a friend or a colleague who's not based in Portugal, or perhaps, uh, you know, we can offer other options, but how do we mitigate the risk of, of trying to domesticate our companies? So you know, in fairness, the, the, at the moment, the Portuguese authorities are not attacking these structures too much. It only comes up with, for example, if someone asks for a ruling. So, you know, effectively requests them to say what they think, or if, if a case is audited for a different reason, and, the, and then this, this comes up. So at the moment, people really enjoy their LLCs. Yeah, you know, how long would that last? Who knows? So you know, when we think about people's taxes, we always try and think, okay, what happens if they do ask? Well, so is it is it a genuinely foreign company? There should there should be good answers for that. But if you do have good answers for this, at the moment, income distributed from LC is not taxed in Portugal okay. at all. They again, they could of course change that policy, but that is the policy now. And interestingly, Portugal is not unique in treating LLCs as companies. The Spain does that. The UK does that. So other countries uh, don't treat these these entities as pastoral entities yeah uh, for, for all sorts of reasons that's yeah. no point getting into it's kind it. of a weird american thing you know like yeah really it's, it's unique it's a unique way of in, incorpor incorporating because any other partnership in europe people have a right to get a bit of the distributions in an llc you could keep the money in the llc forever and never distribute it and that's unique and that is part of why they are treated as as companies because it's a separate entity that can make money and keep the money so that income will be not be taxed in portugal and you only have to mitigate the risk that Portugal could see this as a Portuguese-based company. 
Yeah. Which, as you mentioned, a couple ways that you could do that, which is having people run it in the U.S. Contractors, employees, yeah, colleagues, uh, other partners. Uh, it doesn't have to be in the U.S. It could okay. be elsewhere. Yeah, outside. Uh, as long as it's out, it's actually better not to have it in the U.S. Really? Uh, because in, if if it's in the U.S., you have to be careful about not destroying the foreign end income exclusion. The foreign end income exclusion depends on the on the money being sourced outside outside of the U.S. So if you create too much U.S. connections, if you, for example, selling a physical product in the U.S., uh -huh. then you no longer get the, the foreign end uh, income exclusion. Okay. You, can, you can still do it, but you need to be very careful on how you do it. So, which is uh, why it's really important to talk to a tax expert. Yeah, the, the, these are the situations. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, these are the situations. Okay, um, great. It's it's a at the moment it's, it's an anomaly because it's an entity that's treated one way in one country and another way in another country, and, and the outcome is really good. Yeah, and I think also there's only a few thousand Americans moving here each year. And the percentage of those that are not retiring is small. And then the percentage of that that actually have an LLC, it's really a very small percentage of the population here. Yeah, well, maybe percentage wise, but yeah. I, I speak to a few of these every week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so and then last thing um, are S Corps, which is another way to structure your business in the US. If you move here with an yeah. S Corp. If LLC is unique, then S Corp is really, an, uh, is, is really a strange thing. It's uh, an S Corp is an entity that has a, a mandatory salary. You have to pay yourself a reasonable salary and the remaining money is a distribution. So it's not earned income, but it's, and it's passed through. So it's reported in your personal tax return, but it's not a dividend, but it's reported on the same, on the same form as a dividend. So it's like a super unique entity that uh, exists only in America and only for Americans. I generally, so there is one one case where S corps are good in Portugal, and that is where, where they are extremely profitable because the salary element of the S corp creates the same problem with, as as a W two creates. It, it creates this anomaly that both countries want to tax it, and you sort of you're potentially in a, in a dispute in with one or, or or both of the IRSs. So the, the salary element is tricky. The distribution element is better than distribution from an LLC. Both are not taxed at the moment in, in Portugal, but the likelihood that Portugal will start taxing S-Corp distributions at some point is lower than the likelihood that they will start taxing LLC distributions because in American law, an S-Corp distribution is, is a proper distribution. Right. Even if it's not a dividend, it's very similar to a dividend. Whereas an LLC distribution really is self-employed income. Yeah. So it's, just, it's, a, it's a risk management exercise. Mm -hmm. how, how much do I fear that the policy is going to change? It's kind of very hard to, to assess it. But if, if an S-Corp has a 90% profitability, it probably makes sense to sacrifice the, the, you know, the little mess that you need to deal with on, on the salary side in exchange for, for a better protection for your distribution side. Yeah. Okay, so we kind of talked about a lot of American kind of business structures and how they'd be treated here. Is there anything else like that is really tax advantageous for other people that are going to be moving to Portugal? Let's think about uh, the UK, for example, which is another big demographic of, of yeah. people that always move to Portugal. I think two, two points that I would really pay attention to when, when I'm coming from the UK. One is royalty income. A lot of people have creative businesses or brands, or all sorts of or software, all sorts of IP rights that they're making use of, and they don't even understand that they're making use of these IP rights. And I, I was um, uh, recently advising someone in the video industry, and uh, that they were effectively what what that person was saying was generating income from intellectual property, and they just hadn't understood that this is what he was saying. So it was fully taxed on other types of income, but royalty income uh, under NHR the NHR regime is exempt in Portugal if the assets were. Created created uh, was being out of Portugal, which was the case. Okay. Um, it's also exempt in uh, under uh, UK, under UK. So it's not, it's not exempt. It's the, the UK has a right to tax it, but it doesn't. Okay. Which is the best, which is the best case scenario, because if, if the UK has the right to tax it, this is what triggers the exemption in Portugal, and then it doesn't tax it in uh, in effect. So you, you could end up with that type of income not being taxed anywhere. So it's very beneficial to classify income uh, as royalty income for pretty much anyone who's not American. That, that I think that's one really interesting point. And I think people don't usually think about their intellectual property assets. I mean, I happen to, to come from an intellectual property background, mm -hmm. so it's, it's kind of natural to me to think, oh, okay. Oh, Okay, well, let's see what, you, what you're actually selling here. And sometimes it's your services, but sometimes it's your brand, sometimes it's your website, sometimes it's your 
uh, know-how, um, you know, templates. It could be lots of things that are, that are uh, creations that you're now monetizing and you just haven't realized that this is what you're doing. Yeah. And, and then another, um, another thing that, that uh, people from the UK should be really careful about is uh, if they go to a half-decent tax advisor in Portugal, they would be told that dividends from the UK are, from UK companies are exempt on both sides. And that's wow. true. I mean, the dividends, if you, if you generate income in a, in a UK company, you will pay corporation tax in the UK, but the dividend, dividend would be exempt in the UK. But because the UK has the right in the tax treaty to tax it, that it's not using, it will also be exempt in Portugal. So UK companies are generally considered to be quite a good vehicle for generating income. What people often don't know is that it doesn't apply in a partial tax year. So if you started, okay. uh, if you move to Portugal in May or June, and the tax year in the UK is, is April to April as well, and you took a dividend on that year, which a lot of people do, it's still fully taxed in the UK. So you know, people are told, oh, you, you know, you can take it, you can take dividends, and they do, and then they figure out, oh, oh no, <laughs> I'm, I'm taxed in the UK, and all I needed to do was wait until the until next May, and then I wouldn't be taxed at all. And then it's you're again taxed if you go back to the UK in the first five years, and most people know that. So uh, you have to be kind of really careful about how these systems interact with each other. Even if you're fine on the Portuguese side, it's kind of yeah. really really check. Uh, what's happening um, on the other side. Yeah, and the same goes with the US. You definitely need a US-based CPA that really understands expat taxes and how it relates to your business. And hopefully that you have a Portuguese side that can talk to each other. Yeah, well, I mean, we've, we've created the business out of, uh, out of understanding uh, both systems, but, but we, co we coordinate taxes a lot with people's existing advisors. So you know, the fact that we understand the, the UK and the US system uh, that doesn't mean that we don't coordinate tax with, with existing advisors that know the clients and, right. and so on. And then, you know, some cases are, you know, people come with a lot of uh, thoughts and rumors and, and con yes. con conceptions. I mean, I was recently advising a, a Swedish-American couple. Sweden doesn't have a tax treaty with Portugal because uh, Sweden canceled the, the tax treaty. Portugal is, it's unclear whether Portugal treats the, the tax treaty as existing or, or canceled. And then they're also American citizens. So, you know, we just go on a, on a group chat with the Swedish advisors and, and, and their existing American advisors and us, and we, we figure it out and, and, you know, what the best structure is. Yeah. But the fact that you come, you're coming from a country that without a tax treaty in Portugal doesn't mean that you won't benefit from the NHR regime. It's, it's more nuanced. It's uh, sometimes you will and sometimes your income doesn't come from the same country. So that, that's nuanced. Sometimes the fact that you come from a blacklisted country such as the United Arab Emirates means almost nothing to your, uh, to your taxation in, uh, in Portugal. Portugal has a double taxation treaty with, with uh, the United Arab Emirates that uh, supersedes and overcomes the fact that it's a blacklisted country. So it no longer really matters that it's a blacklisted country. Uh, there is a double taxation treaty and it applies. So people have this concept of how things are, going, are supposed to work. And then it, it's not quite how it works. Right. Sometimes you need to sit down, look at the treaties. And uh, you know, we sometimes, I sometimes said, look, I, I just don't know. I just need to look at the treaty and think about it. Maybe spoke, speak to a colleague on the other side and, uh, and make sure that, the, that there are no glitches on the other side. I think that's a great uh, example of why it's important to get a tax expert that's willing to to like look into your specific situation to get the best outcome for you. But even if you aren't ready for that yet, you have someone very helpful who is Joanna. Yeah, Joanna's great. She's a tax bot, so she's a, she's a piece of software, but she, she looks like a person on Facebook uh, Messenger. And um, uh, she, what she does is basically ask you the, the basic questions of where are you from and what's your income sources and, and uh, what, what I would normally ask people in a consultation. And then ba on, on the basis of these questions, she would explain the basics of how, how the Portuguese uh, uh, tax system applies to you. She, she's uh, phenomenal in always responding straight away. So, you know, you never need to wait for her to reply. She is always there, you know, being being a, a piece of software. So, you know, sometimes she behaves in unexpected ways, but she, is kind, of, she kind of grows and, and, and we improve her with time. And then when people do need uh, or do want proper consultation from a, from a human lawyer, we, we can see what they've already told Joanna. So essentially people pay for half an hour of consultation, but we already know the background. Uh, so it makes that consultation much more productive. Well, thank you so much. I think that clarifies some things for people preparing 
to move to Portugal and how their taxes are going to work. I still think uh, you're going to probably need to reach out to a tax expert and we'll leave the Fresh Portugal website in the description. And that's also where you'll find Joanna. All right. So thank you so much for your time. I hope this was helpful answering like some of the basic questions people might have um, in preparation to move to Portugal. If you found this helpful, I hope you'll like the video. Go talk to Joanna about taxes, not me. <laughs> and then subscribe to our channel and follow us on Instagram at Honeymoon Always. Thank you.